let me just talk for a minute about my hometown of Woodstock, growing up in Woodstock. My uh, father's boss at the Woodstock Electric Company did not take Roosevelt dimes and change in the stores. My father, I would be walking down the street with him and he would whisper to me, that's a Democrat over there. My God. And then I grew up Republican. It was the only way to be. But I became a liberal. Why? Tell me what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. Today, Vermont has gained a famous reputation, perhaps an infamous reputation, as one of the most liberal states in the Union, home of a major progressive third party, electing the United States Senate's only self-proclaimed socialist, and the birthplace of a host of left-wing legislation that starts here and spreads throughout the country. So how did this once rock-ribbed Republican landscape turn deep blue? And why should you care? You know, I came to Vermont in 1962 and bought land up here in the Northeast Kingdom, in large part because of the political history of the state, of responsible, uh, liberty-loving, uh, penny-pinching, if you will, farmers uh, who had made the state uh, sort of a bastion of my idea of republicanism for the previous uh, century. I was startled within a year to see the outcome of the election that put Phil Hoff in the governorship. Because all of a sudden, that whole century of uh, slow but stable uh, pro progression had been overturned. Phil Hoff election in 62 is that it's just at the beginning of the influx of out-of-staters to Vermont, which it really was in the process for, what, 20 years. But so an awful lot of scholars in the public, too, um, think that the breakthrough of Phil Hoff in 62 as a Democrat was uh, a result of socioeconomic change. I argue that it's a result of politics. And we were in a partisan warfare with a Democratic, liberal Democratic governor and a, lar a large majority Republican legislature. At that time, partisan conflict began in Vermont. With a Democratic governor with great ambitions like Phil Hoff, uh, the state started off uh, at breakneck speed down a different path. There's a couple of articles on that. One was a 1972 Playboy magazine article called Taking Over Vermont. And it was a Yale College political professor. And he was basically talking about this idea that you would have, you know, 200,000 countercultural activists move to Vermont as an experiment in progressive politics to take over the state and enact progressive politics. One of the best books on the subject was by Greg Guma. He's a um, journalist. And he wrote a book called The People's Republic. He wrote about this migration of these different waves of left-wing counterculturals in the 60s and 70s. And you had the environmentalist, you had your um, Workers' Party types, you had these various groups of environmentalists, of different left-wing groups. Guma was one of them. Sanders was one of them. Uh, the newcomers uh, uh, rolled the old Vermonters, who didn't understand what was happening to them until uh, it had begun to happen, uh, perhaps irreversibly. But over the last decade and a half, the dynamic in Vermont has changed. It's no longer about the left coming to take over Vermont. Now, it's about the left using Vermont to take over the rest of the country. Bad ideas take root somewhere and flourish. And the bad idea that captured Vermont this year may turn up in my state capital next year or five years later. This is the Petri dish theory. 
that once you start with an infection in a little dish of nutrient, pretty soon the thing is a science fiction story of it takes over the whole laboratory and crawls out into the street. There's two things about Vermont's position nationally, I think now, that deal with the question of how significant we are and how much we matter. Uh, one of them is that, um, that we're a state, and as a state, uh, we get two senators. Uh, so therefore, each individual Vermonter is hugely more important than an individual New Yorker, for instance, because think of it, that Vermont senators can trump Texas senators or California senators. That's not democracy, that's a republic. And, and, and we do very well because of that. So we are much more powerful than we ought to be, given our size. Uh, we don't have as many people as a good-sized county in New York State, and yet we can trump the whole damn state, which pleases us immensely. The general purpose we have now is to get a petition uh, in every town in Vermont, or as many towns in Vermont as possible, to get on the ballot an item at uh, town meeting day to vote we urge our federal delegation to propose an amendment to the Constitution which declares that corporations are not people. From radical environmental schemes to radical campaign finance restrictions to radically progressive tax and social engineering policies, Vermont takes pride in its mission to lead the rest of the nation down the same progressive path. For very little input or resources, you get a lot of bang for your buck. You get something that can get national attention, that can become a wave, a trend, or, and that you can look, it's, you, work, you, 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 you try it out on a small model and then people are, are motivated to try it out on a larger model. They can spend a million dollars and pass same-sex marriage. They can spend a million dollars here and pass physician-assisted suicide. They can spend a million dollars and pass some greenhouse gas initiative uh, that then becomes the model for your state. And these causes have lots of outside help. The success of the left and its causes in Vermont is no accident. Vermont-based organizations like the Vermont Public Interest Research Group, or VPARC, the Worker Center, the Conservation Law Foundation, Patient Choices are all funded to a stupendous extent from out-of-state interest groups. VPIRG, for example, has an annual budget of roughly a million dollars, which goes an awfully long way in a tiny state of 620,000 people with a dirt-cheap media market. On the issue of climate change alone, VPIRG received grants of $460,000 over nine years from the John Merrick Fund out of Boston to, quote, combat global climate change and get an enforceable cap on greenhouse gas emissions. $50,000 from the Belden Fund out of New York, and another $50,000 from the Rockefeller Family Fund. Also for climate change, the Conservation Law Foundation has an even bigger budget. In 2013, Vermont became the third state to pass a physician-assisted suicide law after the organization Patient Choices Vermont spent over $150,000 in largely out-of-state dollars to support the campaign and Governor Peter Shumlin actively pursued out-of-state cash from marijuana legalization groups with the promises to make the issue a priority. It's hard to track that kind of money. Uh, all you can look at, I think, is the number of, of organizations that are part of the left-wing coalition. Okay, the finances of the Vermont NEA Teachers Union are public knowledge. Uh, the AFL-CIO and its affiliates are part of that movement. Uh, you have the Peace and Justice Center, you have uh, the Conservation Law Foundation, you have the Vermont Natural Resources Council, VPURGE, and a galaxy of left-wing organizations that uh, are working uh, par either parallel or hand-in-hand -hand to produce uh, the perfect little state. And for them, that perfect little state is one that believes government is good, more government is better. Similarly, Vermont's left-wing political machine receives an overwhelming majority of its money from outside Vermont. 87% of Senator Patrick Leahy's war chest is funded from out-of-state sources, the highest percentage of all senators. And Governor Peter Shumlin's 2012 bid for re-election, he received over 48% of his campaign funds from non-Vermont sources. 
whereas the predecessor Republican Jim Douglas never exceeded 20% from out of state. Shumlin's out of state fundraising reveals conscious, strategic effort to nationalize the Vermont governor's office and, in fact, the entire Vermont legislature. So, why is it important for Vermont to do what it's doing? It's important because we show the nation how, and the world, how to do things that need to be done. Because if we can't get them done in a state that has only 600,000 people, then you can't get it done in a country that's got 600 million. And the most famous domino of all, same-sex marriage. No matter if you're for or against this policy, there's no denying the fact that proponents of same-sex marriage used Vermont as a launching pad. One of the big stories this week is Vermont. Vermont, of all places, has pretty much okayed gay marriage. The Vermont uh, Supreme Court the other day decreed, they said the state must provide gay couples with the benefits and protections that flow from marriage. Before same-sex marriage, there were civil unions. The term was coined in Vermont. Thirteen years ago, Vermont became the first state to extend rights to gay couples. Maine has become the first state to legalize same-sex marriage by popular vote. Passage along with the governor's signature makes Maryland the eighth state in the nation to legally recognize same-sex marriage and the fourth state legislature to do it in the past year. New York State Senate passes by a vote of 33 to 29. The bill that legalizes same-sex marriage in Rhode Island has just passed the full Senate. And what's the next big thing germinating in the Vermont Petri dish? Single-payer health care. A national single-payer health care system has been the goal of progressives in America for a century, and with Obamacare as a first step, they feel like they're on the cusp of success. I happen to be a proponent of a single-payer universal health care plan. If we get a good public option, it could lead to single-payer, and that's the best way to reach single-payer. Single do nothing until you get single-payer is a sure way never to get it. What we need is a national agenda and a kind of commitment to universal health care. I mean, I'm all for a single-payer system, uh, eventually. All they need is one little state to lead the way. We gather here today to launch the first single-payer health care system in America. The Vermont State Legislature, the Governor, and the Congressional Delegation are able to work together effectively, and I believe we will. We have a golden opportunity today, not only to significantly improve the health care system in the state of Vermont, but equally important, be a model for the rest of this country in moving America forward in a very new direction. Vermont can lead the nation. Vermont went a very different route. You had this rare joint session of the legislature with your whole congressional delegation. And you were addressed by a uh, Harvard consultant, an economist, um, who laid out different proposals for single payer. You are leading this charge, Governor Shumlin. Why? The biggest challenge for business in Vermont, or one of them, is the rising cost of health care. And I think what uh, we want to do here in Vermont is to create a single pool, much like General Motors, Ford, Oracle, uh, ensure that health care is a right and not a privilege. My vision is that if Vermont can get this right, the other states will follow. Well, the first thing that people need to understand is that single parent in Vermont is really about single payer nationally. Single payer is a national movement. Um, there's an agenda on the part of a lot of folks who feel very strongly that uh, socialized medicine, a government controlled monopoly medicine, is where the nation needs to go. And being able to prove that point or demonstrate what they believe is the solution to our health care delivery and finance problems is a very, very difficult thing for people to do. So they need a, a, a laboratory. They need a place to test their theories. And since Vermont has become so uh, willing, if you will, to be the petri dish, to, to be the, ex the laboratory, 
for many of these um, very ultra-liberal um, kinds of concepts, social engineering concepts, if you will, um, this becomes the logical place to give it a try. And um, given the election outcome from 2010, where we had for the first time the governor and the leadership in both the House and the Senate, the first time in the history of Vermont, all of the, all the levers of power, legislative and executive branches were in the hands of people who were long-standing supporters and advocates for single payers. So that was the alignment of the planets that made it possible for Act 48 to be passed and to put Vermont on the path to demonstrating for good or ill um, whether or not single payer is something that the nation should embrace. And once again, it's out-of-state money fueling the fight. Going all the way back to 2004, we see examples of grants to VBIRG from Blue Moon Fund out of Charlottesville, Virginia. $80,000 to advocate for single-payer health care. The Nathan Cummings Foundation out of New York, $50,000. Vermonters for Single Payer received over $107,000 from the George Soros Open Society and funding from the Haymarket People's Fund and Physicians for a National Health Program, all out-of-state organizations. The Vermont Workers Center received 12 grants totaling 190,000 between 2003 and 2009. Every penny of it came from out of state. A new organization, Vermont Leads, formed to push single payer healthcare during the 2012 election cycle, received $113,000 from the SEIU. The SEIU doesn't even have a single member in Vermont. And also, in 2012, the Robert Woods Johnson Foundation gave nearly $500,000 directly to the Green Mountain Care Board to explore ways to end fees for service health care. And these are just a few examples of the resources the American left is pouring into Vermont with the expectation the results will spill into the rest of the nation. And it's not just activists pouring money into Vermont. There's also a lot of federal money that's coming into Vermont to do things like uh, enhance or replace our um, enrollment and el eligibility systems for Medicaid and use those as the infrastructure for the exchange and if we don't have that money um, that's a big hole. Maximizing the use of the federal tax credits to cover Vermonters. Um, if those tax credits aren't available we either have to cover Vermonters without, any, without adding new resources to the system or um, raise taxes at the state level. Both of those are difficult for a little state all on its own. Um, and um, there's also, so the tax credits are probably the most significant part of it because that's really fundamental to our coverage plan um, and we'll have to figure out how to replace that if, if we don't have those resources. It is amazing that the federal government would think that the 630,000 people in Vermont would need in excess of $200 million just to put the machinery in place to do this. It's rather amazing when you think about it. Um, so the notion that the federal government might come up with a billion dollars to give single payer a, 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 a boost come 2017 is not a crazy thought. It's entirely possible, especially with the current administration in Washington. It's, it's entirely possible. You put a billion dollars down over three or four years, and single payer can actually look pretty good for a few years. You can make it look like it's working. It's going to be eating the seed corn, but you can make it look like it's working with enough free money. And it might look like it's working just long enough to give the, the national advocates and the advocates that are, exist in every state in this nation the influence they need um, to get other states to do likewise. Dr. Richter, did you actually move from Buffalo, New York to Vermont for this purpose, to get one state in the nation to pass single payer? And why did you choose Vermont? Uh, it was one of the major factors as to why we moved here. I was trying to do advocacy to get a single payer healthcare system in New York, uh, very naive of me, I think, and realized I was spinning my wheels in New York. And I really, at that point, felt that, the, that it needed to happen in one state or several states, and I figured Vermont was a wonderful place. So it's, it's very accessible, and there's only 300,000 voters in Vermont. So it seemed like 
why not? It seemed like the right thing to do. The pushful single-payer system in Vermont, to put it in Shap Smith's terms, is Vermont is has every intention to become what is known the Saskatchewan of the U.S. Now, Saskatchewan was the Providence in Canada where the single-payer system started out and then metastasized from there and became a federal system. But it didn't, it didn't, it wasn't imposed by the federal government all at once. It was took off in one Providence and it spread from there. So Vermont um, political leaders have said that they want to become the Saskatchewan of the U.S. Well, if that was simply how they saw themselves and and you know their own self-image, that wouldn't be an issue. But they're actually seen as the tip of the spear in the push for nationalized health care by a lot of other people. The people who live here who are polled, about 50% of them don't want this. And if you ask them, do you want it if you have to pay taxes for it, the number goes up much higher. So the people who live here really don't want this program, but it's being foisted on them from outside by politicians who have been bought by outside political influences. It's not a healthy thing. Vermont is on the verge of being doing something that no other state has done. Mm -hmm. And if we can do it, it will begin to lead the country and to lead other states. So what exactly is it that Vermont wants to lead the other 49 states to adopt? What does single payer really mean? You've got to understand, the state of Vermont has granted the Green Mountain Care Board authorities which don't exist anywhere else in the United States of America. They can tell a physician how much you are going to get paid, what you are allowed to earn in a year. They can tell a hospital or a physician what you can charge for a particular procedure. They have the authority to essentially direct all of the funding and to control all of the financing decisions and actually to control how compensation is even made. And they're exercising that authority as we speak. Weeks ago, the Vermont House announced its intention to regulate the private practice of medicine in Vermont out of existence. A bill designed to protect the right of patients to enter into private contracts with their doctors was voted down as a threat to the viability of Green Mountain Care. The scientific evidence available does not demonstrate that the move from big insurance to big government will help physicians to take better care of their patients. When the state controls how doctors are paid, it opens the door for the state to use an elaborate system of financial rewards and punishments to manipulate the clinical decision making of doctors. When the state's central database is up and running with no opting out, the bond of trust between patient and doctor will be strained to the limit. What it really is saying, it's a monopoly. One payor, one monopoly. You have no choice. You can't do this or that. It will be decided for you. Tell us what you want. Yeah, you can't do a thing. We're going to do it our way. Because if, the, if everything envisioned in this bill comes to pass, including Green Mountain Care, about which there are still many questions, this board is essentially going to be running like 20% of Vermont's economy. And I have grave doubts in the ability of any five people to really be able to do it. From what I can tell, these five people are going to not only need to know a great deal about the health industry, but also have the combined wit and wisdom of Solomon, Oliver Wendell Holmes, and Judge Judy. And I just don't think that, you know, I, I'm just very, very nervous about that. I did not like making any kind of commitment to a program where we did not know who it was going to cover, how it was going to cover, what the benefits were going to be, and most importantly, how we were going to pay for it. If you take the um, personal income tax, the rooms and meals tax, the gas and motor fuels tax, and the sales tax, you add all of those together, you're still $400 million short of $1.6 billion. So you could double all of those taxes and you still have to stay, would still have to find $400 million additional dollars to fund single payer based on the governor's very rosy and optimistic analysis. A lot of the problems that Republicans and conservatives face in Vermont is about money. Uh, you brought up VPIRG. 
$800,000 budget. Uh, the Vermont Workers Center, that's another, it's funded from out of state. There's a new organization that just popped up this year to fight for single payer health care called Vermont Leads, funded $137,000 from the SEIU, all out of state money. All out of state money coming in. And I think a lot of people on the national scene, both within the Republican Party and within the conservative movement, have written off the state of Vermont. And I think that that's a big, big mistake. In 2011, the group Vermonters for Healthcare Freedom was formed to fight single payer. Governor Peter Shumlin and the Democratic majorities in Montpelier want to completely uproot our health care system and spend over $5 billion on a single-payer health care scheme. But they won't tell us how they're going to pay for it or what our benefits will include until after the next election. In 2012, Vermonters First, a super PAC, emerged with a million-dollar startup fund provided by a single Burlington, Vermont donor, focusing on a number of issues. I've been in business for 31 years. 15 years. 13 years. Vermont is my home. But getting by here is harder every year. Now some Democrats want to expand the sales tax. To include services. Like auto mechanics. Barbers. Carpenters. Designers like me. And the list goes on. This will kill jobs in our service economy. And make life a whole lot more expensive for everybody. An eight cents a gallon gas tax increase? That'll make it harder to do my job. Vermont Democrats are proposing at least $70 million in new taxes on working Vermonters. Call your legislators and say no to these higher taxes. The groups have shown some success. Despite being vastly outmanned and vastly outspent by groups on the left, Vermonters first, with a roughly $300,000 ad buy, targeting an expansion of the Vermont sales tax to include services, managed to knock that issue from its perch as a legislative priority of the Speaker of the House going into the 2012 election, completely off the table in 2013. We do need reform, but we must find a better solution. That sends a very, very powerful and positive message to the other states in this nation that are looking for solutions to their health care costs and access problems that it, we do still have a limited opportunity to get it right. And we can't get it right if we just keep blindly moving ahead with single payer. But if we can take that pause, if we can find a way to convince the powers that be that this is, it, that this is too important to just roll all the dice on this thing and say we'll solve the funding problem later, then we can, we can be the Petri dish that shows the rest of the country what the real alternatives are. And maybe what is best for Vermont isn't going to be single payer, I'm convinced of that. But maybe it doesn't work in Massachusetts or New York or Minnesota. But if it works in Vermont, we have the opportunity to at least show other people how to answer those questions. We haven't even asked the questions here. And that's the tragedy. We're just blindly implementing something that, quite frankly, can't work.